Okay, so this is lecture 13 of ECE 5312. So what happens is we saw a little bit of vectorization in the last lecture. We looked at power efficiency. We looked at a variety of modulation schemes and everything. And, and, and what we're going to do now is we're going to go into uh, this lecture as well as lecture 14 and lecture 15. So what we're going to do is in the next, this lecture and the next two, we're going to cover the topic of optimal detection. You might say, whoa, 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 isn't this a signal estimation and detection topic and not a digital comps topic? What we're going to do is we're going to talk about optimal detection and how we build an actual receiver based on the optimality of these detectors. Okay? So a lot of folks are asking me, okay, when will the random processes kick in? So that is a prerequisite for this course, and, and you're absolutely right. We do uh, need probability, and it's going to come in here. The vectorization comes in here. And so everything's going to come into this uh, sort of like um, in, into this framework that we're going to be using now and for next two lec uh, lectures in order to create receivers that can optimally decode and in particular, in lectures 14 and 15, the premise is operating in an AWGN channel. So this is sort of a generic setup, and then we're going to follow through in the next two lectures when it's applied to AWGN. All right? So when we talk about detection, and for every communication system, that we must do detection. It's essentially, it's some sort of educated guess based on what we're observing being intercepted over the air. And you might say, oh, that shouldn't be a problem. That should be relatively straightforward. Not really. Like, ask, ask the folks in my undergrad software-defined radio class, right? It's like, what are the things you need in order to detect any signal, right? First, are we on the right carrier frequency? Oh, oh, are we off? Uh, uh. So frequency offset. Then, you're intercepting the signal. OK, well, where should I be sampling this guy? You know, what's the proper sample to get the symbol from that sample? And then, OK. Where's the start of the frame with the information? Where do I start decoding? Where, like, you know, there's all these unknowns, and, we, and the only way that we can detect anything is, first of all, the receiver has a priori knowledge of what your alphabet is, what are the symbols that you're going to be sending over the channel, right? But otherwise, it's up to you. It's up to the receiver. There's no secret cable between your cell phone and the base station that's communicating with it saying, by the way, start sampling. No, no. So the goal is that we have receivers that are always right. Yeah? That, I would love that. Imagine if you're the guy who says, yeah, I have a receiver and it's 100% right. It's like, you know, you hear about folks, especially in the reliability world, but in cellular service providers, they talk about 6-9 reliability of their network. That means 99.9999% of the time, your network is up and it's providing information, right? Um, so, like, you know, so that means it translates to a few hours of outages per year or something like that. Now, imagine if, like, you know, you have 6.9 reliability um, for your trans transmission system, which means that 99.9999% of the data gets across and you don't miss anything, there's no corruption and stuff. Another way of looking at it is, you know, from the glass half empty perspective, the bit error rate. Right? We want to keep that to a minimum. We want to keep it, we, want to, we would love it if we had a bit error rate of zero. So the criterion for optimal detection is that we want to, basically the message we reconstruct is equal to the message that we send. That's, that's the ultimate goal, right? And so we want to maximize that. Uh, the flip side, if you, if you are you know, the negative person, like um, is you want to keep errors to a minimum, right? You want to keep errors to zero if possible. Right? So one thing that should be noted, and this is the start of the probability uh, workup, is that the probability of error is the complement of the probability of correct detection. Right? Probability of error, PE, is equal to 1 minus PC. So as I mentioned before, a communication system consists of some sort of information source that produces messages MI that gets modulated into symbols SI, in this case is vector modulation, right? So we're, we're basically abstracting the entire environment into a vector space. It then gets influenced and corrupted, like, you know, bad stuff happens, bzz, 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 noise. That's exactly how it sounds like. Yeah, don't take my word for it. I think we're being recorded. No, just kidding. 
We are. Um, and then it's received, a corrupted signal. And this cloud, this is supposed to represent innovation on your part. Because do you have a say in how much noise is introduced? Absolutely not. Unless you have some sort of like godlike power that I'm not aware of. Like, no, there should be less noise. And then all of a sudden, wow, five bars. Like, that would be freaky. If you did that, I'm going to run. Um, can you change the transmitter? Probably not. Because just, I, I believe I mentioned in this class, I definitely mentioned it to several folks, when you look at a telecommunication standard, from what perspective are they defining things? The transmitter. The receiver's up to you guys. So that's where the engineering comes in, is the receiver. So what we're going to do is we're going to operate on the premise that our received signal is equal to some transmitted symbol, SI, that we don't know. Oh, no, sorry. We don't know which SI is transmitted. And we vectorize it plus some noise that hides its identity or tries to. So uh, the first thing we do, and this is a little confusing from year to year whenever I introduce this notation, is suppose the received vector is equal to rho. So rho is just a dummy vector. It says, this is what we're literally observing, rho. What is it? Okay. So the, que the question now is, what is the definition for the probability of correct reception? So I'm trying to be positive. <laughs> and the answer is, is one of these e in integral expressions. The answer is this. The answer is the probability of correct reception is equal to a volume integral of the, pro the conditional probability of correct reception given that the received signal that we observe, the only thing that the receiver has information of in real time is we're receiving a signal r equals rho. And what we're trying to do is rho has a PDF. So that means we have a probability density function of every possible row that your receiver can pick up. Right? So it's a continuum of possible values. And it's a vector. And so rho, and so, so first of all, it's a vector. So if it's n dimensionals, our PDF here is going to be a joint PDF across n dimensions. That's why we have the volume. Volume's probably not the best choice because we're dealing with n-dimensional space, and we're integrating across the n-dimensional space that, that joint PDF that's multiplied with the um, conditional probability. What we're essentially doing is we, are first of all, need to calculate the probability of correct reception for a specific observed intercepted signal, rho, and then we essentially sum. We weigh the likelihood of receiving that rho, and then we sum all those conditional probabilities multiplied by the weighing factor for all rho. So what I'm doing is I'm covering my bases. I'm basically creating an average probability of correct reception based on every conceivable rho that my receiver can pick up. Right? Now, that probability is always going to be positive in zero or zero. Uh, same thing with the PDF. We, we don't have negative PDFs. We don't have negative probabilities. So this is good. Because now, uh, what we want to do is, um, we essentially want the probability of the correct reception to be max. And this is achieved. So, so what we're doing is we're building up this story, right? So what happens is, probability of correct reception, that's a maximum. And because, it, you know, because we have these guys that are positive, um, and, mm. and, and uh, these, these guys are positive, and therefore, that conditional probability, right? So we have a PDF. And what we want to do is we have this guy being a maximum. And so in order to get that guy, that conditional PDF, to be equal to a max, what we want to do is we come up with a decision rule. And what's that decision rule? So we saw this before. This is all conditional probabilities. This is, so this is, this is the guess. So I'm observing this row. What is the probability that SK got transmitted, given rho? And probability greater than the probability that SI was actually transmitted, given that observation row. Right? Simple decision rule. 
So suppose I transmitted SK at the transmitter. Let's say I spit out SK, boop, and it's influenced by noise, and then we pick it up as rho. If this works well, this, this, this decision rule, this decision rule over here, this probability that SK, given we observe rho, is greater than the pro conditional probability of SI being intercepted, given rho, this should hold true. And it's an error if it's not. Right? So this is the first starting point. So the decision rule is, like, because it's a guesstimate. What's, what's, what's the probability that this guy, you know, the probability that we got SK and the probability we got SI, based on observing the uh, output. So, like, for instance, let's say I say, how? Okay, what is the probability that I said hello, given that you heard versus the probability that I said goodbye? Right? And you would say, it's, I'm about 95% sure he said hello. You know, probability, statistics, whatever. Right? We'll go into details on how we calculate that probability. But what happens is we can't be for certain because we have, sure, SK, SI, they're deterministic, not the noise. We're dealing with random stuff. We're, an, we're adding a stochastic process to this, so we're not going to be sure. It could be really bad. There is a probability that we do not correctly detect, right? So, so as a result, okay, suppose we've got this scenario. The row is actually equal to that SK and corrupting noise. What we want to do, ultimately, is we want to sort of rewrite this entire process, this decision rule, in such a way that we can actually create, um, you know, some sort of mathematical formulation. Okay, so we're, again, we're going deep into probability theory here. So what we want to do is, so we have the decision property, right? So probability of SK given rho must be greater than the probability of SI given rho. That's our decision rule. That should hold true. If not, then it's an error. So what I want to do is, so we, we're dealing with conditional probabilities. Is there a way that we can make this better? Is there a way that we can manipulate this decision rule? And one thing is, whenever you see a conditional probability in this course, there's, you know, just a gut feeling. How many people are thinking Bayes' rule? Just, like, you should be screaming Bayes' rule. So I'm going to I'm going to incorporate like you know everyone's probably seen the old school Bayes rule right so the conditional probability of a given b times the probability b is equal to um, in this case uh, the probability of a and b which is equal to the probability of b given a uh, times the probability of a Bayes rule right now you can also do this with PDFs that's something I think I touched upon in the probability course when it, when I taught it. You can rewrite everything in, pro in, in terms of probability density functions. Now, the third one is, is the oddball, but it's so helpful. What the, the third one, the third approach to Bayes' rule, we call it a mixed Bayes' rule. We intermix probabilities with PDFs. So what we have is essentially we have this guy here. So the probability that we received SI given that r is equal to rho, that we've observed rho, times the PDF of rho. Rho is a random event, right? It's a, it's a random process. It's a stochastic item, thing, variable. So what happens is it has to have a characterization. And that should be equal through this mixed Bayes rule formulation. The PDF of rho given SI, and you might say, Physically, what the heck does that represent? Again, I'll show you, right? Times the probability that SI was transmitted. So I'm flipping things around here. This is actually pretty cool stuff because let me, let me draw it. Oh, you, you, everyone's probably waiting for when I was going to say that. So oh, I, miss, I miss this thing. I really do. I asked my wife again if I can have one. And she says, why don't you take it from work? So don't tell school. OK. So what happens is it's really neat. So we have our decision rule. Okay? 
And we saw that it's the probability of sk, the vector, given that we observe rho, or r equals rho, is greater than or equal to the probability. So I, I'm using the little bar here to signify the p is a capital, because you can imagine this gets ugly quickly, especially if your handwriting is like mine from like, it hasn't changed since grade three. Um, no, true story. Check out my writing samples from grade three. So what ends up happening is you have the probability of this and that. And so you say, OK, this is great. How do I translate it into something that I can use? So now comes mixed Bayes rule. Okay. And so mixed Bayes rule says, OK, the probability of getting an SI, any S, Oh, let me erase that. I want to be nice. Doop, 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 doop. Uh, given r is equal to rho, just, just notational, times the PDF, so I'm going to use little p, that's my attempt at little p, of rho, okay? And Bayes' rule says that this should be equal to the PDF of rho, given si, times the probability that si was transmitted. And you might say, okay, so what? Okay, I'm not sure if you, everyone's thinking exactly those words, but, but you're probably wondering why I'm like so, well, I'm, I'm actually quite mellow today, as you notice. I'm not jumping all over the place. But, but why is this such a big deal? Because think about it. Um, suppose this is an AWGN channel. What would the PDF look like? So let's say it's zero mean. Has a uh, you know standard deviation on both sides, right? So what happens is, so let's say that guy. Remember our vector model. R is equal to S i, or actually should be S k, plus n. So what I'm doing is, is S i deterministic or random? And the answer should be deterministic, because what happens is we know the exact shape. We don't know which one sent. That's the random part, but Assuming we know that we sent a shape, it has a very de defined form. Suppose that the energy, or whatever the characteristics, let's say it is some sort of constant waveform. What would happen when you add a constant to a random, pro a random variable, a random process? You change its mean. So think about it. So this guy here, this expression, so I'm going to use, oh, my favorite, I miss you. Okay, so this guy here is actually pretty cool. So what does this guy tell me? PDF of rho. What am I observing given that an SI has been transmitted? What does that say? So if it's a Gaussian noise, so I'm overstepping. This is actually lecture 14 stuff, but I, want, I think it, help, it will help illustrate. Plus it gives me an opportunity to use the whiteboard. What happens is, think about it. This is my PDF of the noise. I'm adding now a deterministic signal, it's so it's going to be potentially a non-zero mean. It's going to be a bias. So how does that change the PDF? It moves its mean. So now imagine if you have SI and SK, they're two waveforms with different means, right? Like let's say they, they be, let's say one is a positive constant value, one's a negative constant value. What do you get? You get essentially get two Gaussians at two different locations, right? So what you'll, you'll get is, let's say SI. So this guy, oh, that's, that's cool. What this guy is going to look like is essentially, here's your Gaussian, but the mean is actually not zero anymore. And it's kind of interesting because what, what happens is this coupled with this term, so this term what this, this does is it sort of tempers our excitement. So it's, it, w what happens is it is possible that all the possible symbols that are transmitted are equally likely to be transmitted, or it may not. So what happens is we, we sort of weigh this PDF by how probable it is that we transmit SI in the first place, right? So we're trying to be as fair as possible to this calculation for the optimal detector. All right? So 
Well, and so let me, is that in red still? So here's zero. So it's pretty cool. So let's say that's your, this is your conditional PDF of rho given SI. So now let's suppose then we have another guy here. So this is for illustrative purposes. Suppose we have, like, so that's mu1 and this is mu2. And this is, let's say, a PDF of rho given S, um, SK. And what that does is essentially it shows us that um, every time we insert a symbol, depending on how it looks, and this might not be true for all cases, but this is for illustrative purposes, you can observe that the incoming statistical behavior of your signal will probably have a deterministic component that will be re reflected by the zero mean noise being shifted or manipulated in some way that can give us a sign as to what has been transmitted. All right? We're going to use this totally in lecture 14. So I'm, I'm just jumping ahead. But does everyone sort of get this? OK? So this is where the magic comes. Okie dokie. So this guy here is going to be your friend. So what this guy does is, remember we talked about what is the probability that we intercepted an SI given that rho has been observed, r equals rho. So that's our decision rule. So we take that decision rule, and we plug this in instead, right? This is super important. I put a big star, or my attempt at a star. So a big fuzzy thing, bzzz. so lack of color, but I put right next to it very, very important. We're going to see this now, lecture 14, lecture 15. And what this tells me is that that probability uh, that we picked up an SI given that we observed rho at the receiver is equal to the PDF of that rho given the SI. So it's almost like we're flipping it around. We're almost like saying we're observing this assuming that we got SI. And then times the probability that we transmitted an SI. And then divide by the PDF of rho. And you might say, well, how, how come this? Like, Shouldn't it be like some sort of conditional? Which row? This, this PDF, what happens is just like with every, like, you know, if you have numerous cases, this is going to be averaged across all possible cases of, like, you know, row given S1, S2, S3, S4, times the probability of all those occurring. So this is actually the average of all those PDFs, right? Okay? So it's like a law of total probability thing. Right. Now, Oh, yeah. So what we want to do, the detector, OK? So one thing is the decision rule. But what we want to do is we want to design a receiver that maximizes this. So what we want, OK, so I'm going to flip back to a couple of lecture slides. So we saw this in slide two. No? Uh, yeah, OK. Yeah, here we go. So in slide two, this decision rule, right? Our goal, so if, you, if let's say you were working in a company for me, grad students, that almost is, no, just kidding. Not even close. So but what happens is, what's my goal if I'm going to design a receiver? My goal is. I want to make this guy, I want to design a receiver that if I do transmit an SK, given that I just observed rho, I want to make this guy the largest possible value. I want this thing to trump every other possible SI. That's my goal. So what I need to do is the following. On slide four, what slide four says is exactly that. What we want to do is we want to maximize this guy. We want to find, we want to find out the max. Our detector is, uh, you know, so we go across all these i values. And essentially, given the observed, and because, OK, this is a great format, but let's use that mixed form of Bayes rule. We have this thing here. So now what we want to do is several things. First of all, we're dealing with potentially an n-dimensional vector for the rho, for the si, for the n. So what we, what we need to do is this is going to get messy. Remember that volume integral? So if we had m dimensions, this is going to get ugly very quickly. 
if it's got use. So what we want to do is we want to sort of cut some max. And I don't mean Max as a person. I don't, and no one's here called Max. No middle names, Max. No, no. Okay. If anyone, like, you know, I think I, I, I have my grandparents' birth records, the original ones from Poland, somewhere. And I think their great grandparents. There was a Maximilian somewhere. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> yeah, my my grandmother's name. Any any guesses on what my grandmother's name was? And it was really weird. I don't think anybody here knows it. Anyone? No? No, don't say Dorothy. Like, so, you know, so it's an Eastern European name. Uh, the Germanized version of it, if the German equivalent is called Hedwig. And you might say, Hedwig? What the heck? In, uh, in Polish or in Ukrainian, it's the same thing. Yadviga. So it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yo. <laughs> Anyways, I digress. So the first thing I want to do, I'm going to cut corners. So maximum, all I care about is finding the peak. So anything that does not get influenced by the choice of SI, I ditch right away. What's the first thing that I see? Oh, that pesky denominator. Is there any SI in that? Absolutely not. It's, it, there, there's an, it, it's totally independent of the SI. So I get rid of it. Right? Now, so what's left? So I have max SI across all possible value of i's of the conditional PDF of rho given SI times the probability of SI. And so um, you, some of you might have seen this, but sometimes I don't care about finding the maximum. All I care about is finding the value of SI, or in particular the index, I, that yields the maximum. So we use argmax. Bless you. So what happens is uh, that's what argmax is. And it's, no, it's not because a pirate wrote this. Like argmax, you know. No. What happens is argmax means give me the argument that yields the maximum across all SIs. Give me the I that gives me the largest possible value here. Right? So if we do that, what we get at the end of the day, what happens is we call this formulation, we call, there, there are two formulations that you'll be familiar with. And, and just to let you know, I already posted on our uh, on the course website uh, the problem set with solutions for 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 this set of lectures. And uh, what you're going to see is you're going to see MAP and you're going to see ML. MAP is maximum a posteriori detection, and ML is maximum likelihood. And the difference between the two is the fact that with MAP you don't make the assumption that all the SIs are equally likely to occur. The problem, and that's going to influence a little bit, sort of like, you know, specific cases that you're trying to solve for. ML is if you say, oh, yeah, 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 all the SIs are equally likely to occur. So, so if there are M possible SIs, what's the probability that SI occurs? One in M, right? Does that depend on SI? Absolutely not, right? Does everyone see that? Let me... People are like saying, huh, what? No. So this is what I mean. So let's say I do max SI, the probability. No, bad. Oop. The PDF, okay, of rho given SI. Um, the probability of SI, right? Now, what, what, what's interesting is if this here, is equally likely, equally likely. What this means is that each P S I is going to be equal to 1 over M, if there are M of these guys. So now, if we rewrite this, right, we get max SI, the PDF of rho given SI, 1 over M. Does this depend on the choice of I? And the answer is absolutely not. So we say goodbye. So what ends up happening is, 
we can now make the simplification. Now our, we have what they call maximum likelihood detectors. All right? So given that, now we have the simplification. And so what ends up happening is, at, why do we call it MAP and ML? Um, just, just very briefly, the MAP so uh, uses the information a of, of an a priori distribution of the transmitted symbol. So the receiver says, I've noticed that SI, this S1 is transmitted with this probability, S2 with this probability, and so on. So we actually have sort of like looking at the transmission behavior for this time duration. And of course, it gets tricky because what happens if, let's say, the transmission changes over time, right? On the other hand, ML doesn't depend on that. No, a maximum a posteriori. I might have to double check that. So, but but essentially one hat like it. Now that I think about it, yeah, maximum a posteriori. Let me double check. But I think what happened. Basically, the difference is one assumes that I have complete characterization of the transmission data, and one says absolutely not. I'm assuming that I don't know anything about the SI behavior, right? So. So. Uh, so what we're going to do is, as an aside, and this is kind of important because is that there are some likelihood functions, right? But likelihood functions essentially are these conditional, these condi these conditional PDFs, right? And we've seen these before. But what we're more interested in is not so much these likelihood functions, but rather the log likelihood. So what we're interested in, because imagine later on when we're going to be dealing with AWGN channels, I'm going to show you how we can manipulate the conditional probability such that it ends up being a form of Gaussian PDF. Oh my god, so how do we find a maximum of an exponential? We use this little guy, right? So, so stay tuned. So, so that's just an aside. But what happens is, why can we likelihood? And the first thing is, the PDF is non negative. If we have a negative value, anything, and we use log, that's the first thing. And then the other thing is, logarithmic functions are markedly increasing functions. So what happens is, theoretically, we should have a one to one mapping anyway. So if, like, you know, let's say we have some sort of function, and then we take the log of it, if we have a that max gets translated to the log domain too, right? So this, keeping this in mind, this will prepare us for essentially the next lecture where we're going to introduce a specific type of noise, AWGN, additive white Gaussian noise. All right? So, so just let's let's recap. So what we've just seen. Because this is actually quite a lot of theoretical stuff. We're no longer playing with signal concepts, right? So what we, what we looked at, essentially, in this lecture is that we have a decision rule, right? And our decision rule is essentially the probability that we received an SK given that a row was observed and the prob we want that probability to be great, the, the largest possible, because we actually sent an SK, versus, let's say, the probability that an SI was actually sent, given that we observe a row. And this is based on the vector model that we sent an SK, it goes through a channel, noise is added, and we observe R is equal to rho, right? Then we saw, okay, well, let's put this into a format that we can actually use. So what we do is we take this guy and we use Bayes' rule. We use the mixed Bayes' rule representation. And doing so, what we find is that this guy, the probability of SK given rho should be equal to the PDF of rho given SK times the probability of SK happening divided by 
the PDF of rho, which is an average across all possible transmitted signals and observing rho at the input. And then we saw, we saw that this guy, if we take the max, he doesn't have any SI in it. So we can actually safely ignore. And then depending on whether this guy is, has equally likely occurring symbols or not, uh, we get one of two possible forms, a map detector or an ML detector. All right. So what we're going to look at in the next lecture is we're now going to go through the math. And, and, we, and what I just did as a quick aside, and you might say, oh, okay, it must not be important. Professor Wilmski spent 30 seconds on it, is going to really help us a lot. Because logarithmic functions, because we're dealing with positive numbers and a log function is monotonically increasing, which means that a maximum function, do we care about the absolute value that's produced? No, we only care about relative values. Is this point bigger than that point? I don't care by how much, but is it bigger? So a log is a perfect way, especially when you're dealing with exponential functions. All right? So that, that concludes um, lecture, lecture, um, lecture 13. Okay. Okay, so what we're going to